Okay. Now, the major contribution to Marx, in my opinion, was that he and Engels both tried to provide an understanding or a, an, an account of why things are the way they are based in a very un unusual and novel approach to understanding gender and sexual relations. And that would be instead of looking at it from, let's say, a religious point of view um, or some sort of uh, nature, you know, like this is the way it's always been and so this is the way it has to be sort of perspective, they looked at it as a function of economic relationships or economic structures. And although that doesn't sound very original to us, <laughs> that's because we're used to that. Right? Using a, a separate sociological causal structure that was meant to account for the way things are without an appeal to you know, God or, or, or nature, something that was basically supported by patriarchy, we could maybe think about it that way. It um, meant it gave a new perspective. It, it kind of took things out of that world and put it more into things that we can change. If we change the means of production, then we'll change human relationships. So, um, hey, no, it's good to be back. And yeah, I had uh, a, I had Sunday off last week. I had an Easter Sunday, and it was very nice. It was so important for my mental health actually that I took like almost a full week of vacation. I'm thinking about doing it again. <laughs> That's how good it was and helpful. But Marxist implication for feminist theory is that it places the role of family and relationships in historical context. Ergo, roles are the results of situations and not eternally given. That's a more efficient way of saying what I was babbling on while I was trying to organize the, the um, screens around me. And two, change will not be brought about by appeals to reason or principles of justice, but only as part of changes in conditions of production. Now, Marx had a lot of things, a lot of good insights, um, had a lot of good perspectives. He was not 100% uh, right all the time, right? But that is how... Generally, theories work. Someone comes up with an idea. Other people pick it up. They criticize it. They say, this doesn't work. This does work. And they sift through it. They add their own things. They take things away. And we move on. Like, that's the production of knowledge. Oh, God, of course, I have to click on this thing. I just want to press the arrow. Okay. Now, when it comes to Engels, Engels was the author who more than anyone focused on the feminist sort of perspective in his book, The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State. Now, last time we went over his perspective, and for the rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about um, how does, how is it put? I think this is, uh, there was a good way of summarizing this in the next section, which was, we're reading from Feminist Political Theory, an introduction by Valerie Bryson, second edition. Which edition? I can't remember what edition it is now. Anyway, it's old. But the stuff on Marx is fine because that doesn't really change very much unless there's some new insights. But the relevance of Marx's concepts. Before we criticize Engels, we're going to look at, um, despite his criticisms, what other things. Right? So to some extent, these problems... Uh, with Engels' perspectives, maybe relatively superficial, a product of Engels' personal limitations and prejudices, rather than the underlying methodology. And it is important when we talk about using science as a way to take people's biases out of the process. That is a goal of science, but it's not 100% foolproof. It's, and a lot of times, especially in the social there can be values smuggled in, which if you understand that and you're transparent about it and opaque and there are alternative ways of measuring is, is you know, the best way to handle it because you can't remove subjectivity from the study of the social, the political, you know, the economic, the religious. However, there remains the problem of whether Marxism is really able to see or understand any non-economic sources of oppression. And this is related to its understanding, underlying theory of history. In the German ideology, Marx and Engels both saw production and reproduction as the basis of society. Quote, the production of life, both one's own in labor and of fresh life in procreation, now appears as a double relationship, on the one hand as a natural, on the other as a social relationship. Uh, so we're going to look at some criticisms of Engels' takes in the origin of family, private property, and the state. However, overall, 
you know, there is um, the, con the original contribution of methodology and also some problems. So Engels, as we're going to talk about last time, rejected the idea of the modern family as natural. His proposal was that the earliest societies were really promiscuous. And there was some like group marriages and everyone was like it was free love and all this kind of like funky stuff. Now, is he going from anthropology? No. <laughs> Again, I would put more of an appeal to like Hobbes in the state of nature. This is a thought experiment. The problem with a thought experiment is that it's not based in reality. So you can make some assumptions about things and take them to their logical conclusions. But in a thought experiment, that's not a representation of what we actually know, right? So Engels is breaking new ground in that he's trying to understand what a firm application of his theory would imply for society if it's the case that the means of productions uh, are not bound up, that, that production is free and people do their own things. The implication is that people are free. That means if the structure, the economic structures aren't class-based and dealing with private property and all that stuff, that for him leads to an immediate freedom. So then he has to explain, well, how is it that we got to have the structures we had? So you start off with this, you know, state of nature or whatever else. And he proposes that early societies were egalitarian. Okay. Again, means of production, right? So this is the one-to-one -one relationship. But he assumed that in animal husbandry, men, which is part decided, oh, look, I can have all this stuff. So I can start to accumulate all of these animals that produce things and I have surplus, right? And then this view of property changed men's views of other things, right? Men wanted more control over who inherited their wealth. And therefore, they had to overthrow this sort of group marriage, free love, everyone banging away, doing your own thing, uh, and everyone like chips in to raise, you know, the kids and distribute that labor because now the ownership extended to his heirs. And he wanted to make sure, again, this is all Engel's speculation. Right? He wanted to make sure that his heirs could enjoy the fruits of his labor and build on them and pass on. And then for that to happen, men who wanted to preserve their wealth had to overthrow this imagined egalitarian society in order to exert more control over their progeny, which mean which meant controlling women and their sexualities um, and their reproductive capacities. And basically, instead of women being these, you know, like free, equal, free love societies, women were turned into property because they produced heirs. They were seen as another source of wealth, as it were. Therefore, when you have changes in labor relations, you would then have concomitant changes in the relationship between the sexes. This is the basic premise that we're working for. And yeah, we can say that there's a lot of flaws, but here's my take on, on theories that are narrow but precise. Right? Marxism is a very narrow theory. Uh, and I think it works well as a narrow theory because it allows us to exclude a lot of other factors. So I'm kind of a theoretical purist, as it were. The, the example I use is rational choice theory. Rational choice theory, which we've talked about, discusses things in terms of a cost-benefit analysis. We look at the cost of engaging in a behavior, the probability of the benefits of engaging in that behavior, and, yeah. and then you subtract the cost from the benefits of the probability of the benefits. And if the probability of the benefits you know, outweigh the costs, people should, in a rational calculation, take, you know, do that thing, right? But in a situation where the costs are higher than the probability of the benefits, the, the uh, rational thing to do is to not engage in the behavior. Hence, if you think about voting as a cost in terms of the time it takes to get to know the issues, where people are on the issues, your candidates uh, that are, are running um, versus like the national party platform. It's a huge cost to educate yourself to vote. Right. And then there's the going to the polls, organizing your day. Maybe you have to get child care sorted out, whatever else. All of these costs. And what do you get? Well, you're not going to change the outcome of the election. So from a cost benefit analysis, when we look at it that way, uh, it's not rational to vote. Now, that's good that rational theory doesn't explain this behavior because it allows us, in my opinion, to exclude a pure cost-benefit analysis. We know that that's not what motivates people.
Um, and therefore, we can kind of exclude that and look at non-rational or emotional motivations, because that's what it's expressive things. And if you try to put expressive benefits in a rational choice model, in my estimation, you end up diluting the power of the model to be precise. Same thing with Marx. The, the narrow thing about production and the concomitant outcomes and structures is, I think, really narrow. And it's okay to say it doesn't work in this situation. So, um, <coughs> yeah, I don't, I don't like theories that try to expand and explain everything. I'd rather you be precise and narrow and wrong because that tells us something about the world than to be vague and imprecise and just say, and, and, and very promiscuous in your application of the theory and the explanation. All right, so despite Engels' opposition to capitalist exploitation, he did see that women's paid employment was a progressive force. It gave them some economic autonomy and ability to participate in ways they hadn't before. But he thought that by replacing a capitalist system with one based on common ownership and collectivized work, this would accelerate women's liberation. Because again, he's looking at it purely from a structural point of view. And if I think we talked about this, structural um, structure versus agency. To what extent are people's behaviors determined, at least in some sense, the options with, that they have to work with, determined by the structures within, they, within which they live? And how much of people's behavior is can be explained by their own independent decisions. And it's not an either or. Structure agency, again, is this sort of yin-yang of, yeah, concomitant. <laughs> Go look it up. I'm pretty sure that's a word. <coughs> um, where was I now? You got me all distracted. No, I can see your comments. Yeah, that's how I'm, I'm making sure everything is, is, uh, is good. Um, Common ownership and, okay, I forgot where I'm going now. So, um, so accelerating women's liberation. He thought by changing the means of production that would produce it. Oh, yes, and that comes down to individual stuff. All right, so this means that without any changes in the economic conditions of women, we will never see progress. And we know that that didn't work out that way. Right? We, we saw a lot of, in, in many ways, we saw it was easier to change the legal structures for first wave feminists and for a second wave feminist to use similar, calling the personal is political, um, to make advances in, in the legal realm than it was to make changes in the economic realm. You, know, you can put in laws about non-discrimination, but that just gives you a remedy after it already happened. So to recap, Marxism provided us with an account of women's changing conditions as a result of the pr as being a product of economic processes. Women's subordination started with private property and a class-based society. The proletariat class was already chipping away at women's subordination, and this would disappear. Women's subordination would disappear entirely in the socialist revolution because once you change the conditions, there's no basis for oppression. Uh, okay, so what did people have problems with? All right. Uh, okay, let me get to page 73 because there's a little... I said 73, but I think it's 72. It must be 72. Yes. Okay. So it says here that Engels thought, yes. All right. Let me go back. Engels claimed that the present arrangement was characterized above all by hypocrisy. Enforced monogamy for women was accompanied by sexual license for men, while adultery and prostitution rather than fidelity and love were the basis of modern bourgeois marriage. He thought that this would be replaced not by promiscuity, but by individual sex love which he believed already characterized relationships among the proletariat. Dude, dude, my dude. However, he refused to speculate in detail about future sexual relations, arguing that these will only be known, and here's the quote, when a new generation has grown up, a generation of men who have never in their lives have known what it is to buy a woman's surrender with money or any other social instrument of power. A generation of women who have never known what it is to give themselves to a man from any other consideration than real love, or to refuse to give themselves to their lover from fear of the economic consequences. Ew. All right, you can probably already see that. There's all that smacks of patriarchy. There's still so much sexism in there. So let's now go through the criticisms of Engel, because as much as there were some original contributions. He was a product of his own time. So here are some sus, I guess, like sus anthropological claims that underline his premises, right? 
he assumed a universal pattern of family development from all, all going all the way back to the first human societies. Now, of course, he was also working in the mid-1800s, and we have almost 200 years now of um, archaeology and anthropological evidence to show us that that is so not the case. But again, I'm kind of like comparing this to Hobbes' state of nature. The state of nature is never a real place. It um, it's a it's a condition of being that we can imagine, but it, it doesn't have to exist for us to imagine like the logical implications of how human societies would be organized, right? So I think if you know, there's some use utility in doing the thought experiment of of if it was the case we had societies where there was an original condition of equality amongst all sexes, that you know, what would the economics about that be, or how would the economics affect that? And so he asserts that there was this original condition of sex equality. There's no evidence for that. There's, there's just none. We have a lot of speculations. We know um, that labor was divided, you know, like everybody pitched in with food gathering. Oftentimes meat was not a staple, meaning that more gathering and harvesting or when it became the point of moving to agriculture, and that was the primary source of most humans diets and that um you know so women were obviously participating in that too so everyone was participating <coughs> and he assumed that early men had all this this universal global desire to leave property to their their heirs uh, once they figured out animal husbandry uh, so there's a lot of things in here that are just sus it's it's fantasy and so even though it's interesting as a thought experiment we wouldn't should we shouldn't put too much emphasis on this actually being the case because it, it wasn't he also has some really sus sexist assumptions that reflect his bourgeois white western patriarchal perspective i mean he thought he was being i mean if i put it in, in modern language he thought he was being pretty woke without understanding or super reflecting on all the ways in which he was buying into the kinds of attitudes that led to women's uh, subjugation. And not only women, we should talk about the, the fact that, you know, patriarchy is harmful for trans people, for, for um, it's homophobic, right? And it also, it, it hurts cis men and, and trans men through its norms as well. And so even though this is narrowly focused on a, a, a false gender binary, we should in our modern times, keep more of a, a broader critique of, of patriarchy that isn't just helping us feed into that gender binary. Because honestly, for me, one of the things that um, has been a big transformation in my conceptualizing of the world has been not using this simplistic heuristic of man-woman. I mean, even in the aggregate, if you said it that, you know, um, blondes and brunettes... Right. Like if you divided all of human society in blondes and brunettes, like you are excluding them another category of redheads. Right. And you say, oh, well, you know, redheads are kind of like blondes, you know. And so if we just have to if we don't want to simplize a simple binary, it just makes it easier for our calculations or whatever else. And that's just, that's kind of how I feel about um, cisgender stuff is that every time we slide into this simplistic convenient binary that it really reinforces it subconsciously. So I'm going to make a conscious effort to expand feminist critique, uh, which is ultimately a critique of patriarchy, to the full extent in which patriarchy is repressive. Right. So <laughs> moving on. He assumed that there was this original and natural division between the sexes. And the thing about uh, Engels is that he he doesn't really interrogate that he doesn't investigate that assumption about this division of labor. In fact, he kind of builds on it by assuming, you know, the solution to childcare and housework is collectivization. Right? Women need to collectivize <laughs> and redistribute their women's work. Which, like, mate, almost there. Just so close so close like collective yeah but your pool of of people who are participating in the labor uh, irrationally narrow so yeah he assumed that in socialist societies housework and child child care work would be collectivized but done by women so um that's really not so liberating <laughs> he was also really blinded by sexism 
His focus on the sexual division of labor meant he really ignored women's labor in pre-capitalist societies. The focus was on a, a very simplistic, we almost want to call it modern, um, modern, modernistic or modern perspective, as opposed to postmodern, right? The grand narrative of history, these simplistic things. And it was just, you know, men saw cattle. Men were like, I want cattle, my cattle, mine, um, baby calves, mine, mama cows, mine, all mine, mine, mine. And I want to make sure that um, the child that comes out of somebody is also mine and I'm going to give my stuff to my child. Like, that is... It's it makes sense given our current society because that's a reflection of our current society. But what he's kind of doing is just taking assumptions about how property and inheritance works in the 19th century and retrofitting it. Eh, you know, um, these are this is his speculation. There's no evidence for this. Right? Engels also now um, acknowledged the women's problem of combining paid work with domestic responsibility, but he never really analyzed this implication deeply. He acknowledged it without unpacking it, as it were. And he never suggested that the women, the burden that women face in having to provide both domestic labor and paid labor, which is something that women have been doing forever, you know, and it might be paid labor, I mean, um, commodity, a commodity, women producing something that could be then sold and turned into something else, whether that was local jar um, canned foods or little homebrew beers or salt that they'd made from brine in the Middle Ages or whatever else, making those economic contributions. On top of all of the house labor, he never said, hey, you know, in, in after the revolution, men will vacuum. <laughs> Metal, men should do the dishes. Proletariat men should take on more of the burden, uh, the labor, contribute more to the labor of maintaining the house. Like that, whew, nope, nope, not on his radar. Not on his radar. Yeah, he wasn't that self-aware. And later critics pointed this out. Okay, yeah, um, he had this very rosy view of the proletariat family. And again, you know, it's it's just ideological blinders, right? He was seeing things through a fairly, you know, a new lens. And over people tend to, when they get a good idea, they tend to use it too broadly or see it through uh, rose-colored glasses. But he, yeah, never interrogated the relationship within the proletariat household to make the point that, well, you know, maybe the husband is exploiting his wife's labor, because that would mean that the exploitation that was supposed to be alleviated by a proletarian, you know, like revolution, it would just be reproduced after the revolution. So that, I think, is one of the, the more um, biting criticisms of Engels, because ultimately it's there's there's sort of a categorical error that you can make, uh, like an inference error that is an unconscious bias. Like Engels, I can understand it didn't occur to him to tell men to do the housework because that didn't exist in his world. He didn't have a framework of reference for like men, you know, like taking on all the housework to free up their their partners or wives because we're going to talk about a gender binary in the 19th century because that was all we had. However, um, you know, he didn't apply his own critique of private property and labor and stuff to the proletariat. So he didn't understand uh, um, that he didn't understand this this sex specific oppression that he was reproducing by um, or sorry that he was analyzing when he looked at women as workers. So he never, for instance, analyzed uh, the the lower pay that women got and that uh, that's that role or why that would be why that outcome would be produced. And he never considered that men would have serious opposition to women competing with them in the labor market, which wasn't so much of a factor when, of course, women were getting paid less and being shunted into crappy jobs. However, we do see this opposition of the proletariat male who comes back after the Second World War and women are in the factories and women have been doing a good job and women are running the companies and running businesses and they got, you know, they got S locked down. You know, it's working and men come back and they're like, get out of the way. 
All right, so that kind of sexism just isn't on Engels' radar. And while he rejected the hypocrisy of chastity for women, but adultery is fine in men, he also suggested that, um, you know, morality is dependent on economic needs. Uh, sorry, so that was one point. So he, he did do this rejection of um, the hypocrisy, but his suggestion that morality may be dependent on economic needs is a theoretical advance, but he constantly assumes men's sexual needs are naturally greater than women's without reflecting on whether or not this view is a reflection of social and material conditions. So he didn't kind of take his own theory far enough. He had a sort of set, you know, here's the family, and I'm going to look at it from this perspective. But he didn't really interrogate the relationships within the family or the distribution of labor within the family or this assumption in his own society that men's sexual needs are greater than women's. So while he is, you know, making progress, in a lot of ways he's reproducing the same patriarchal tropes, norms, and reinforcing it. And, and unfortunately, this, of course, gets smuggled into socialist critique generally. And later on, you have feminist critique uh, being dismissed by some Marxists saying, well, you look, once you change the material conditions, everything will be better. So what women should really do is not worry about their feminist liberation, not women's liberation. However, uh, they should work for the socialist revolution because when we get socialist, you know, like the proletariat has its liberation, all our problems will go away. So, um, yeah, yeah, gender binary in the 19th century, but we are talking about England. We're talking about Western. I'm not talking about, because Engels was really looking, I mean, they only had one case study. So I understand that there's diversity of, of binary, but in for the purposes of the writing, their worldview was a binary, trans gamer girl. So yeah, stipulated, but I'm still right. <laughs> so, <laughs> within, this, within the narrow frame of what I'm looking here, which is Engels' experience, and which is Western Europe. He wasn't an anthropologist, right, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, yeah. So the other thing, again, all these stuff gets smuggled in and really reflects his Victorian worldview. So in this thought experiment of free love, he um, he had this perspective that, you know, there were group marriages and people could have sex freely and this communally raising kids. And yet he took that sexist assumption of women's Victorian women or Victorian view of women of being like puritanical and and uh, prudish and he put all of the things he, on the one hand he said it was women who women who found group marriage degrading but it was men who wanted to control the property so there's a little bit of a contradiction there and he in the quote that I read you he also did this he constantly describes sex as a woman giving herself or surrendering to a man. He did it in this quote twice. All right, I'll just go through it. I, that's why I read it first. So when he says, a woman surrender, uh, um, da -da -da -da, a generation of men who have never known in their lives what it is to buy a woman's surrender with money. I know you should, like red flags already, right? Uh, a generation of women who have never known what it is to give themselves to a man from any other consideration uh, from love or to refuse to give themselves to their lover for, from fear of economic consequences. Again, this is, um, it's a, he's reinforcing the kind of view of sex and sexuality that in the society he was in rather than undermining it, um, questioning it, unpacking it, dismantling it. And it f reinforces a lot of those patriarchal norms that are individual level as well as structural, but, you know, it just shows the limitation of his critique. So, uh, what's this? Yes, and he operates only from a heteronormative worldview, getting back to Trans Gamer Girl. Um, there, there's just no uh, idea. He was actually quite homophobic and described homosexuality as an abomination and thought homosexuality would have no place in a socialist society. And sadly, those values carry right through to the 20th century and, and far beyond. A colleague of mine was interested in East German views. So let me, let me dial back. So a colleague of mine was interested in comparing religiosity in East and Western Germany. Right? So East West Germany is a really uh, fascinating political case study. Because in, for instance, you know, Poland, Romania, in the Eastern Bloc countries, the whole country was taken over. So you have, you know, Soviet versus not Soviet attitudes, influences, production, consumerism, whatever else. 
and therefore you can't do a comparison of like east west or uh, of the divide in the cultures uh in a country like Poland because they only had soviet domination whereas in Germany of course Germany was split between east and west germany so west germany grew up on the western side of values and eastern germany obviously on the eastern one of the things that characterized the soviet era was an increase in atheism and a decline in religiosity although that isn't it's not like the churches were obliterated and obviously the page, the the church in russia right now is you know walking hand in hand with putin so it's not as revolutionary um They've given in to religion and the power of religion, basically. However, you would think that in a society that decreased or put a lower emphasis on religiosity, you would see a decline in the kinds of other values that go with religiosity. So there is a lot of homophobia and like sexual, like uh, you know, sexism patriarchy basically <laughs> so one might speculate that if you remove the influence of religion from a culture it would weaken the basis for patriarchal claims and patriarchal norms in a society whereas in western germany they had uh, you know the free practice of religion predominantly um, in here protestantism and catholicism in the german pop you know german population although that's becoming increasingly like agnostic and more atheist. It's, it's, a, it's a weaker association. And yet, when you look at attitudes toward um, you know, homo, um, homophobia or attitudes on rights for gay people or bisexual people, people in Western Germany are more tolerant of, of homosexual rights and uh, gay marriage and just generally across the board. Then in the West, there's, a, there's still a high degree of toxic masculinity, masculinity and that homophobia and the, the attitudes toward women, uh, despite the fact that there was no religion to hold them up and teach them, the attitudes persisted and were actually more, no, I mean, people in Eastern Germany are more homophobic than people in West. And so just changing the means of production just changing, um, you know, like the reducing the role of religion is insufficient. And I would say that, you know, like this homophobia, unfortunately, is, and it's, it's the sexism has tainted Marxist critiques throughout. Oh, OK, that was your point. Yes. Yeah. Christian. Well, yeah. Christian Europe, um, basically the, the monotheistic religions. If you go back to it, I mean, there was a false binary within Judaism and that got inherited by Christianity and Islam. Um, of course. And then they all thought that they were the best ever. And so anyone else who was different, you know, got it wrong. So but yes. Yeah. There is a diversity of gender identities throughout human history. And the European view is extremely narrow and not based in empirical reality. It's based in religious convenience because um, it's it's very important to patriarchy that you put people into one category or the other because that is how power is distributed. So unfortunate amounts of um, homophobia and still repeating sexist attitudes in Engels' critiques. He also had kind of some weird takes. Um, he thought in a, so in a socialist society, when child care is the duty of the whole community, but really by women, there would be no longer anxiety about the consequences which, in his day, prevented a girl from giving herself completely to the man she loves. I, I guess what he's saying is that once child care becomes a collective duty that people will feel, well, women will feel more liberated to shag around because there is a, basically a social safety net. Like you don't have to worry about going into poverty and you starving and your child starving um, because you have a community of women <laughs> who will chip in to the local communist, you know, like you'll have a spot, the local communist child care center. And there will be food production or food distribution. So you don't have to worry about it. Again, it's just, it's, um, it's it's kind of a weird take. <clears throat> it's quite reductionist. That is an um, we're getting onto the final critiques here. Although the family serves an important economic function, reducing it reducing a family down to its economic function is quite dubious, right? Because it it is overemphasizing structural forces and underemphasizing the role of individuals. So how let me give you an example for that. 
by focusing on the material conditions structuring social outcomes, it ignores really important so, um, psychological factors. And the other thing that Engel complete, Engels completely missed out on is he didn't engage with the possibility that the proletariat families themselves can be sources of oppression. That is something it didn't kind of he didn't take it down to that level yet and look at the way in which, you know, sex based uh, labor, uh, unpaid labor is actually a form of exploitation, which is I, I put this on here. This is like one, like one of the last slides. So in that way, his critique is internally inconsistent. He wrote about how women were abducted in primi primitive societies, but did not explain how that aligned with his claim that. Oh, sorry. This is a different point. So on the one hand, he said these, there were these free love societies with group marriage, uh, equality between the sexes, but he also used the trope of, or at least maybe drew on history, that um, women were abducted in primitive societies. So, you know, you can't have both equality and abduction because you're property. So there's, there's a kind of a, a mess going on there conceptually. And this is better to my earlier point. He's blind to men's complicity. He never saw or criticized sexual assault, for instance, as a way that men have used, uh, have wielded power over women. We see it um, going on right now that um, it's once again a, a weapon of war, right? And it's just really, really revolting and disgusting. And he didn't, he just skipped over that, didn't acknowledge that or engage with it in any meaningful way. He also was blind to the fact that the proletariat family was a source of oppression and sexual exploitation. And he said very little about domestic violence, even though that was a topic that was being discussed by contemporary feminists. So it's kind of a cherry-picked little story that he's telling. Um, he held a very romanticized view of proletariat marriage. He saw it as um, the freely, freely chosen result of love and sexual attraction. But um, uh, we know that's not always the case. He thought that male brutality could not last in a proletariat marriage because the proletariat marriage no longer had an economic foundation and uh, the, the wife was free to leave. But in his ideological blindness to understand, uh, to, to provide an account for the aggregate structural influences on things, he ignored the benefit that an individual husband gains from um, sexual access to and the domestic services of his wife, whether or not there's love involved. So there was, you know, there were some interesting things. Okay, that was the end of it. So there were some interesting things that Engels brought to the discussion. Certainly, it was uh, an important contribution to move, uh, to get people thinking about the result of, I'm going to switch over here. Yeah, this is the one. Hope you all can, ooh, here we go. Um, to think about social relationships not as natural or ordered, which is how a caste version um, of society works or a class-based version of society work, right? Uh, the aristocracy, right? The um, divine right of kings, right? That order is natural. If, if social orders are natural, then to agitate against the social order is to go against nature or slash God. Right? And this equation of what is traditional with what is natural is a way to very easily maintain oppression over time right? um, and to discredit people who question unjustified hierarchies. And as uh, so, um, so in that way, it, it was a, a, an important step forward. That said, it, it wasn't perfect. And it is by identifying flaws, um, omissions, oversights, um, fallacious assumptions that other people, when they engage with the work, are able to, um, for the ideas to evolve and better reflect things in society. Okay, so, um, yeah, next time, because we're still on feminist political theory, so next time what we're going to start with uh, are... Um, so we did the modern criticisms of Mar of Engels, and the next section here, which we'll start next week, is the relevance of Marxist concepts. So we've looked at the positive, and we've also looked at some critiques, but now we're going to try to pull out from Marxist theory what are the things that withstood the test of time. Obviously, this idea of um, you know uh, primitive societies being free love didn't last, but there are some critiques that that made it through the test of time, and there were other thinkers who 
made contributions to this perspective to make it a bit more accurate and grounded. All right. Hey, um, so it looks like we're doing a class. 85% of you said yes, you'd want to do, um, you're interested in doing something. 13, and so 85%, that's 10. That's close enough. So I will get going on that. I'll look for that in June. And my idea would probably be to like kick it off the first weekend in June, run it for six weeks, then I'm going on holiday for two weeks. So we'll do like six and then, you know, like maybe another four or another six, depending on how far we get. So we have plenty of time to organize this and set it up. We've got the Social Science Sunday Discord, so maybe that will get a bit more use now in the weeks coming up. But yeah, I, we've got a bit of time now. If anyone has comments, questions, we can um, can put those on the screen. Um, actually, I can't put this on the screen because uh, it's on a different thingamabob. And I, get me out of this. All right, so I'll give you a few seconds to type any questions or comments before. Otherwise, yeah, I'm going to be heading out here uh, pretty soon. Because I have D&D later on tonight, and I have dumped a whole bunch of Marxist feminism in your ear, and that uh, I feel like I've done my duty. I've, I've done my educational bit. Every day is a school day, and today this was yours. So, let's see. Uh, no, Rook, good symposium. G enjoyed it? All right, fantastic. That's, that's all I really need to know. You know, if you all want... Um, actually, what I can do, I will go ahead and put a link... To the Discord, yes, exactly A to Decay. Uh, the Discord link is expired. So before we leave, I will go ahead and put up, uh, I will refresh a new link. So the reason I don't want to put out um, a link that's just permanent is because, you know, King Crocoduck stands or other people are going to come along and try to do crap in our group. So I'm doing it on a week-by-week -week basis to kind of keep it limited to people I know watch the show and thereby help us to get fewer and fewer uh, trolls. Not that there have been any troll problems so far. All right, now how do I bloody uh, well invite people to this group? Boost this server, social science, invite people. There we go. I see it. Copy, use hidden button. A link expires. Yeah, why? Okay, let me see if this works. I'm going to put this in the chat. Yeah, all right. There you go. It would be inviting and harassment to just have an, an open-ended link. Absolutely, yeah. I, I've been on YouTube long enough to know. So, yeah, go ahead. You can join the Discord. There's really nothing that exciting going on there yet. Um, but now that we have a sort of purpose, one of the things we could maybe do is, you know, have themes like philosophy of social science and people can post video recommendations and, you know, maybe you can watch some stuff here too as we move into the course. So... Uh, I will talk a little bit more about what people are interested in as we go forward. And I have I have many lectures up on my academia.edu page. So it's just a matter of dusting those off. And philosophy of science doesn't evolve too much, you know, in 10 years. it All the stuff on Socrates is still valid. So, all right. Y'all, thank you for your time and attention. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday wherever it is and whenever it is you are. Um, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Until next Sunday, be well and uh, take care. Okay. Bye.